It's solace. And then Vita, you'll have to probably type the CME in one more time because it only you can only see it if yeah you've already been logged in. So okay, cool. Yeah. I, I think it has to go to the attendees. It went to host and panel. Yeah. So you'll have to type it in again, like maybe at the end. So All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Gender um, Equity and Ethics uh, McLean 41st Lecture Series. Excited to have everyone here. We've had a um, good, I think this is our speaker. And if you've been attending, you'll know that we are alternating between virtual and in-person. And um, we've had a series of amazing speakers so far. We're really excited to have Dr. Sales, who I'll introduce in just a second. Give you a preview. Next week will be another virtual lecture by Dr. Marshall from University of Pennsylvania. And then um, after the Thanksgiving break, we'll return to have Dr. Cortina from University of Michigan. So um, we're really excited about the upcoming talks. Let me go ahead and introduce Dr. Sales. Dr. Sales is a national leader in diversity, equity, and inclusion, having earned her PhD studying these topics at Stanford University. Dr. Sales is also a surgeon and has extensive lived experience as a woman of color working in a male-dominated environment. She has completed medical school and residency in general surgery at Stanford prior to completing a fellowship in minimal invasive surgery at Washington University in St. Louis. After staying on faculty at St. Louis, Dr. Sales moved back to Stanford in 2019 to work with the medical school on issues related to diversity and inclusion. Her research focuses broadly on gender equity, implicit bias, diversity, inclusion, and physician well-being. During the pandemic, Dr. Sales has served as a disaster relief physician caring for patients with COVID in the ICU. She has given over 100 national and international invited talks related to gender equity and sexual harassment in medicine. Dr. Sales is a prolific researcher and writer, having had her work published in many prominent medical journals like JAMA, The Lancet, and JAMA Surgery. She also writes for broader audiences through outlets such as USA Today, Time Magazine, and The Washington Post. She is passionate about helping workplaces better support marginalized people, and she serves as a special advisor for DEI programs at the Stanford University Department of Medicine, where she's a clinical associate professor. Welcome, Dr. Sales. Excited to hear your talk today. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's great to be with you all virtually. And, you know, I personally, like, I love giving talks in person, but I really love not having to be in person if the place is far away. So I, I really appreciate that you all are flexible uh, with folks and are able to accommodate both. So uh, the title of my talk today is Sexual Harassment After Hashtag Me Too. And, um, you know, we just celebrated the five-year anniversary of Me Too and the hashtag going viral. So before I uh, get into the talk, I hope that people have access to chat um, on this webinar. So I wanted to ask whether uh, if people can put in some names of cases, like when you see Hashtag Me Too, whose name comes to your mind? Are there any particular um, people who have faced either um, allegations or they have been on trial or just at least in the news? Like what, what names come to mind for folks? Harvey Weinstein, absolutely, that's a big one. I'm, I would guess he comes to a lot of people's minds. Yeah, the chat is private, so we'll have to put it in Q&A and we can read it out. Um, oh shoot! It are, okay. Yeah. Well, can we yeah. can we make the chat not private? I think Vina, do you have access to that? If not, that's okay. I, I can just uh, throw out some other names. But yeah. I was trying to make it interactive for folks. Somebody wrote. Somebody wrote David Sabatini. Yes, from MIT. Yeah, I'm going to talk about him a little bit later. Somebody Trump. Trump. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Well, there's really no shortage of people, right? Um, you could say Bill Cosby, you could say Aziz Ansari, you could say Louis C.K., you could say some academic folks like Sabatini, and I'm going to actually talk about several of them in just a few minutes. Um, but the point was <clears throat> just to remember that there are lots and lots of names that we've heard that um, there have been allegations of sexual harassment or assault against 
but very few of them have faced concrete consequences. Like of all those names that um, we just talked about, um, maybe Weinstein is the only one, right? He's in prison. Um, but all the other ones, like Trump went on after those allegations to become president. Uh, um, Sabatini for a, a long time was fine. And we're going to talk about him a little bit more in a second. And he may be facing some uh, accountability currently. Um, but, you know, there's this idea, at least, you know, several years out from the hashtag that it's the pendulum has swung too far and that it's not safe to be a man. I just can't even say that with a straight face, like, but that it's hard to be a, a man in this world and apologies to any men who are here, but you all have some, some privileges that women and, and femme appearing folks do not have. Um, so before I talk any more about this, I am going to talk about some specific cases. And so just a trigger warning for anyone who, um, doesn't want to hear those kinds of details, you know, it's totally fine if you need to um, step away or whatever, but just that is going to be the content of the talk today. Just a couple of quick disclosures for me. I do some consulting work for Intuitive Surgical and Intuitive Foundation. Intuitive is a surgical robotic company. I'm also the co-founder of the Center for Advancing Respect and Equity, a center that's designed to support people experiencing sexual harassment in medicine, <clears throat> although we haven't uh, published our website just yet but um, we're already supporting folks um, just uh, kind of out of the limelight, but we'll be going live with that this month. Um, I'm also a cisgender woman and I am an immigrant. I'm from Iran. And um, many of you may be aware of what's been happening in Iran in the last couple of months, which is a woman led revolution against the oppressive regime there. So I, I feel I have to acknowledge that. Um, and then I am a heterosexual woman. And I share these things because, you know, who we are and all these different aspects of our identity impact the ways in which we show up to all the spaces that we're in. And, and it's impossible really to disengage those aspects of our identity from content that we're sharing with folks. So I think it's just helpful for people to know that, that that's at least some aspects of my identity that relate to what we're talking about today. Now, back to sexual harassment, there's this idea, again, like I was saying, that there's just instant accountability. And basically, when claims are, are brought against people, especially influential people like Andrew Cuomo, that those individuals are immediately canceled and it's unfair, right? That's the whole um, underlying premise that a lot of people have is that it's unfair for there to be accountability. Um, and so people think that what happens is that there's a claim, then there's very quickly an investigation, and then there's very quickly consequences. And that's really not the case. So even though, it, you know, the media can paint this image and give people this impression, what really ends up happening is far more complicated. So before I go any further, I wanted to just ask based on already what we've talked about, like wh what do people think about where we're at as a society here um, about sexual harassment? And I'm sorry, I didn't realize there wouldn't be chat. So uh, you can just think about this and um, kind of maybe write down for yourself. Like, do you think time is up? Like, is it the case? We can have people use the Q&A. We've done that in the past. So feel free to- Oh, put... that's fine too. If people want to yeah. write into the Q&A. Yeah. 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 And then I pub I can publicize it, if, and it, they can be as anonymous. So if you want to say yes or no, um, we can publicize it as anonymous. Right. And the question isn't, um, you know, do you think it should be? <laughs> do you think time should be up? But do you think it really is? Like, are we living in a society now where people cannot get away with sexual harassment? We had one person say no. Very quiet audience today. Definitely not. I like that with conviction. Definitely not. Maggie's one of our students, Argavon. So yeah. Well done, Maggie. <laughs> I mean, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just that, again, there is this idea that we've already kind of handled the problem and there, sexual harassment is no more. And, and I'm going to argue to you, uh, for anybody out there who, who thinks that yeah, the pendulum has gone too far, that that's not the case. 
We have a few other comments. Um, no, people still protect harassers mm. better than before, but not gone. And then another one that's come through chat to the host. Um, I fear that with power and money, anyone can now get away with certain acts. And then um, from Dr. Burnett, our section chief of general medicine, it is known to be unacceptable now, but it's subjective and often slides by. So definitely a lot of um, people thinking about where we are in transition. Yes. Lots of, lots of great points. And, um, you know, this, <clears throat> the one that said um, that we're, I forget the wording, but it was like, basically, um, let me see if I can find it. It might be under the answered better than before, but not gone. Yes. People still, it wasn't that one anyway, whatever. Yeah, but, the power and money was in the chat to the host. So yeah, okay. the power and money with power and money. Anyone can get away with certain acts. Yes. And I think that that's always been the case. So I think that was the comment that was like now with power and money. And again, I apologize if it wasn't that one. Cause I can't see them all right now, but this has always been the case. And sexual harassment is not about sex, it's about power. So that's why when I talk about this, I, I, I show this pyramid and show power differential being at the bottom, the foundation of the pyramid for sexual harassment. Because while there can be sexual harassment going in the other direction, um, it's much less common. It is far more common for people with higher positions or positions in higher power to be harassing those who have lower power, lower status. Um, so once you have a power differential in a situation that allows for things such as gender-based harassment. <clears throat> so gender-based harassment is verbal and nonverbal behaviors that indicate second-class status of people of a particular gender. And that is one aspect of sexual harassment. And we're gonna talk about some specific um, behaviors in, in on the next slide. And the sexual attention or unwanted sexual attention can be things like asking people repeatedly for a date or touching people inappropriately. That's kind of the next um, most aggressive type of sexual harassment. And then finally, what is at the top here is sexual coercion or what people call quid pro quo. So it's basically making particular opportunities contingent on sexual favors. Like you can be part of this uh, research study, you can lead this committee, you can have this job if you perform these sexual acts for me. And so I've also put them in, in this way in the pyramid because they're in increasing degrees of severity as you go up and also uh, fortunately decreasing in frequency as we go up. But according to the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, and other widely accepted definitions, all three of these forms, gender-based harassment, sexual, unwanted sexual attention, and sexual coercion are all part of sexual harassment. And I point this out because often when we think about sexual harassment, even like the examples that we just talked about, we really have focused on unwanted sexual attention and sexual coercion, which are the top two parts of this pyramid. But gender-based harassment is actually even more pervasive. And so the National Academies um, gave this a really nice portrayal, so a visual to help people understand this exact fact that many of the things that are under the water with this iceberg model, so things that we may not actually be noticing, are those gender-based harassment behaviors like relentless pressure for sex, relentless pressure for dates, sexual insults, offensive remarks about bodies, um, sabotaging women's equipment, um, saying things like, you can't do this job with small kids at home, et cetera. So those are a really big part of what is sexual harassment. Yes, it's sexual assault, rape, unwanted groping, threatening professional consequences, all the stuff that's above the water, but it's also all the stuff that's below the water. And I just put a red box around all of the things that I personally have experienced in my career. And, um, you know, it's not to say, I don't do this to say, wow, I, I've had such a bad experience and I'm so different from everyone else. But it's actually to say that I think my experiences are pretty representative of women in medicine. And you may look at this and say, especially for folks who, who aren't women, um, they might be surprised to see that someone has experienced all of this. And I'm not like very old. I mean, I'm middle-aged, but I have a lot of career in front of me, hopefully, and I've already experienced all of these things. So 
what does this look like in academia? How does sexual harassment play out in academia? You know, a lot of the examples that we talked about already were um, in entertainment, which is obviously pretty different. So what happens in academia? Well, I actually wanted to share this example, which probably you all are, are pretty aware of because this professor and anthropologist actually was at University of Chicago originally. And he, this is John Komaroff. So he was at University of Chicago to my understanding of what's available publicly, was asked to leave Miss many years ago uh, because of issues related to um, improper treatment of other individuals and in particular sexual harassment. And what happened after he left was Harvard hired him because why not? And so he went on to allegedly um, behave inappropriately with students and trainees at Harvard. And this went on for many, many years and really only came to light uh, earlier this year when students at Harvard filed a lawsuit against Harvard for their mismanagement of the situation. Because there had been um, internal investigations that did not end up supporting the students who had reported him. And of course, there were significant consequences for these students because they had to change their fields um, because it's such a small field of study to avoid interacting with them. They had to change their entire field of study. And when this came out, um, again, earlier this year, a number of faculty at Harvard actually signed on to a letter in support of Professor Komaroff. And some of these folks are listed here like Jill Lepore, um, but also uh, Paul Farmer, who many of you may know, um, and all these people, you know, it's kind of surprising that they just signed on to this letter saying we support this man. Um, it's you'd have to you have to think like they didn't read what the students were saying, or they I mean they definitely didn't talk to any of the students because when you read the lawsuit, I just don't see how a rational, reasonable person would sign on in support of this professor. And this is from the lawsuit itself, where um, the folks at Harvard um, in, basically doubted the process, the internal review process of Harvard so much that they specifically encouraged students to go to the press. And this is something that had um, been successful for this other professor they cite here, Professor Jorge Dominguez, um, that there was no accountability for in that case until the students went to the press. And even the, the department chair in this case encouraged the three plaintiffs to, to go to the Crimson and then uh, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, so that's a broken system. If you're, the authorities within the institution are saying, yeah, don't worry about our reporting system, it's not gonna work for you, so just go public with your story. This is worrisome for the institution, but also this is a huge ask of these students to go public, to bring a lawsuit. There's so much risk for them professionally, personally. These lawsuits, they do not go like from this week to next week or this month to next month, they're done. These things drag on for years. So it's really embarrassing uh, for an institution that I think probably a lot of us have some respect for to say, yeah, we're not gonna actually handle this. We're gonna ask you, three young people with your entire lives in front of you to alter your path and focus on this in order to right or wrong that we are just gonna let pass. And you they're not- take a break for a question. Oh, sure. yeah. keep going. Yeah. There's one- No, no it's fine. Rates, And then one, set, one question of, do you need to provide evidence when reporting sexual harassment? Um, do you need to provide evidence when reporting sexual harassment? So usually what happens at most institutions is um, there are different ways to report. Uh, I don't know how much detail people wanna get into on this point, but um, the basic pathway usually is somebody raises a concern. For example, you know, a student says, hey, I work with professor so-and-so and he said these inappropriate things to me. And that goes to, eventually at an educational institution gets routed to the Title IX office if a formal complaint is desired. Then the Title IX office at most places will do some kind of investigation. They will talk to individuals involved and, um, you know, try to gather data as best they can to determine what harm was caused um, and by whom. I would say one major issue is that the majority of instances of sexual harassment are not reported because the reporting process actually inflicts often more harm on people than the original act. So that's one of the challenges. So is there um, evidence that needs to be brought? 
Yeah, eventually there is through this investigation evidence, but um, and and I would say for I, I don't know exactly who's asking is what position they're in, but for anyone who's experiencing any sort of mistreatment in the workplace, I always recommend documenting from the very beginning, like the first time somebody says something inappropriate to you, jot it down on a piece of paper, paper, send it to an in, in an email to yourself, put it in your notes on your phone, in some way keep record because you never know what's going to become a pattern later. And that type of documentation, notes to yourself, does count as evidence. Um, was there? You said there was another question. I think I just want to just let the, the most, most most conversation go till the end. I think I'll let you. I don't want to interrupt okay. too much. But, okay, no, that's fine. <laughs> I'm fine either way. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> All right. So what I, what I was going to say next is, so we've just talked about um, an anthropologist who's in academics, obviously, and we're all in academics, but what's happening in uh, medical sciences. And so this is where I was going to talk about Sabatini to the person who brought it up earlier um, or brought him up earlier. So the story in broad strokes is that this person um, is a scientist who is thought to be a genius. Um, I don't like the use of that word. It allows people to excuse all sorts of people, all sorts of behavior that is inappropriate. But um, you know, had done some some important work related to the mTOR pathway when he was a, a graduate student, and you know, was a very well funded uh, researcher. And basically, he was um, at the Whitehead Institute and working through Howard Hughes Med uh, Medical Institute, and had an appointment at MIT when an internal investigation at the Whitehead Institute found that um, his lab created um, a, an environment that was toxic um, and that he had been involved with a junior faculty member um, and that, in, that in relationship or the interactions were inappropriate. Essentially, there's a lot more to it, but that's kind of the basic gist. And what happened after this internal investigation was that he was removed from the Whitehead Institute and removed from Howard Hughes Medical Institute. But he maintained his appointment at MIT for quite a while, um, actually, after all of that. And people may recall that earlier this year, he was um, being considered for a new faculty appointment at NYU. And what um, what people may have seen that was in the news was students at NYU um, and postdocs and other researchers being very vocally against this appointment and to the point that they were in like literally in the streets with signs protesting. And the medical school initially insisted that it was very important to consider his candidacy. And the dean of the medical school put out a statement talking about how um, cancel culture is worrisome and they need to be able to look at both sides. So basically they, they doubled down initially and it wasn't until after several weeks of um, folks within NYU and the press talking about this that they, well, then they, they did a, in my opinion, pretty cowardly thing, which is that they said that Sabatini withdrew his name from consideration. So NYU never even said, you're right, we're not going to consider this person because we wanna create a safe environment for our trainees. They never said that. They just said, well, he has withdrawn his name. Um, so anyway, I guess good news is he didn't end up getting that appointment, but I mean, that was an opportunity for NYU and the School of Medicine specifically to have really been vocal and clear about their support of their trainees and how important it is to create a safe environment for everyone. And they just didn't do it. Um, <clears throat> this is another example. Uh, Francisco Ayala was at University of California in Irvine and had uh, complaints brought against him at least as early as 2015, didn't end up leaving Irvine until 2018, at which point he resigned. He remained a member <clears throat> of the National Academy of Sciences until 2021. So as I said at the beginning, people have this impression that people bring a concern, there's a quick investigation, then there's accountability and it all happens uh, too quickly and it's not fair to those who are being accused. And all these are examples of different ways in which it takes quite a long time and often there isn't enough any justice or in this case for Francisco Ayala some of the folks who had been involved in bringing concerns about him said basically this is too little too late that okay he resigned at the end of his career <laughs> and then after he resigned several years later the National Academy of Sciences e ejected him like is that really anything is that even accountability who knows 
Um, and then there was this very public case um, that came out of, and this is specifically in medicine now, so moving a little bit outside of the research uh, world to directly into clinical medicine. And um, this is a professor who was at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, who again, allegedly had been having uh, many inappropriate relationships. Well, I don't know about many, but several inappropriate relationships over a long period of time uh, with women he mentored. And he eventually, after a lot of um, advocacy from individuals within Mayo Clinic Rochester, was asked to leave Mayo Clinic Rochester, but then was given a chair appointment in the Department of Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, which is really kind of, mind-blowing if you think about it. That's within the Mayo system. It's not even like he went somewhere else. There's no way they could have known and they just hired him. Like, you no, know, within their own system, he was basically getting a promotion. Um, and he had no problem getting licensed in Arizona. There's no checks on sexual harassment when licensing uh, individuals in medicine in most states. And, um, and it wasn't until folks at Mayo Clinic Rochester found out that he had been given this appointment that they were able to complain. And then eventually he didn't end up taking that job um, because, uh, because of this advocacy on the, on the part of the folks at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And even despite that, initially, he continued to hold a really powerful position at the NCI, where he was leading a cl clinical trials group, which was then affecting opportunities for other individuals, including the folks who had brought these concerns about him at Mayo Clinic Rochester. And you see this um, statement at the bottom here from one of the individuals at Mayo Clinic. So she was <clears throat> too embarrassed, ashamed, and frightened to come forward to her employer because she feared more consequences that would further limit her career possibilities because this person, Dr. Grothy, is an influential person. And that's far more common a story than there being, you know, immediate accountability or even any real accountability. So I wanted to share a couple of examples uh, from the Cuomo lawsuit because <clears throat> I think they really are reflective of a lot of what happens in medicine, actually. And when you read it, well, let me read these bits to you and, and think about what you've seen and experienced and whether it resonates for you, but it really resonated for me. So for example, this woman uh, who worked in his office said, if you got yelled at in front of everyone, it wasn't special. It was controlled by his temper and he was surrounded by people who enabled his behavior. As a result, when he said inappropriate things, she says, I was uncomfortable but I also was acutely aware that I did not want him to get mad. So I'm a surgeon. Surgical training is, um, you know, not the best of medical training, I would say, in terms of the culture. And this exact set of, of statements could easily have been made about a number of different faculty in surgery at the different places that I've worked at, where you just, you know, tried to stay quiet, tried to stay out of the way, and then they would yell and nobody cared, like there was no accountability. Um, and on the bottom right, they say, for whatever reason, in his office, the rules were different. It was, you should view it as a compliment if he finds you aesthetically pleasing enough. And if he finds you interesting enough to ask questions like that. And so even though it was strange and uncomfortable and technically not permissible in a typical workplace environment, I was in this mindset that it was the twilight zone and the typical rules did not apply. And again, when we think about all the different things that we um, put up with, that we tolerate within medicine, I feel very much that way. Like there, I'm sure we all have uh, folks in our lives who are outside of medicine and we share stories with them and they're like, how is this, how is this allowed in your workplace? Like it's so inappropriate, but we make excuses and um, people are given a pass because they bring in a lot of RVUs or because they're a genius or, or whatever else. Um, and what really this case highlighted as well is how people, and this was mentioned in one of the comments, how people enable this behavior. People were very aware of how damaging Cuomo's behavior was, but instead of, um, doing anything directly about that, they adopted these strategies like, uh, implementing a practice whereby individual staff members who are women were not going to be left alone with the governor. And we do this as well, right? We tell, we have our own little whisper networks in a way where we warn people like, oh, hey, this person can sometimes be handsy or this person says inappropriate things. Don't take it personally. Or, you know, that's definitely been my experience that there's a lot of that going on in medicine. Um, and ultimately, uh, this, in this lawsuit, they conclude that this behavior by the governor was part of a pattern that extended to his interactions with women outside of state government. 
and was enabled and facilitated by a culture within uh, the executive chamber. And the culture was secrecy, loyalty to the governor and fear, as well as normalization of inappropriate comments and interactions with the governor. Again, all of this I have seen within medicine as well. So that brings me to this, which is coming out of the National Academy's um, report. They kind of defined four main characteristics of workplace environments that basically predispose to or enable sexual harassment to occur. And uh, I mean, even just at a first glance, you can see these are things we have in medicine. So a male dominated environment, one in which there is a hierarchy, a very uh, steep hierarchy in some specialties, where there is tolerance for sexual harassment, where we act like it's not even happening, where we normalize it, um, where we develop strategies to work around these individuals who are causing harm rather than having any accountability for them, and one in which people can be isolated, whether they're one-on-one -on -one with an attending in an exam room, uh, examining a patient, or they're um, in the you know, office, the work room, and it's just two people at a certain point in time, um, or if it's in a lab and it's it's just the res one research the student trainee and their and their um, faculty supervisor or mentor. There are many situations in which people are isolated, especially I would say traveling to conferences. That's another um, risky endeavor that we all have to undertake. So these are kind of the four major characteristics that predispose to sexual harassment, and of these. We have um, Dr. Aurora and, and I and some of our colleagues are trying to address the tolerance bit. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, but that's the piece that we're targeting. Some of these other things are like, you know, we're not going to change the hierarchy in medicine overnight. And we're not going to change the, the representation in medicine overnight either, although we are doing much better in terms of having women in medicine now than we did 50 years ago. Um, but so tolerance is something we, we're going to try to see if we can impact. And again, I'm going to talk about how a little bit later. But because all of those things still exist in medicine, you know, I wrote this article two years ago now, but it's still true. Sexual harassment is really the norm in healthcare, whether it's um, patients harassing physicians or uh, physicians harassing each other, uh, supervisors harassing trainees, nurses. Uh, harassment of nurses, nurses harassing others, all of these things are pretty rampant, or at least they have been in my experience. And I've worked at, I don't know, seven or eight hospitals um, in my career, and it's everywhere. And this is why uh, several of us, including Dr. Aurora, wrote this piece around the Axel Grothy case, which was saying, we've got to stop passing the buck. We've got to stop passing the harassers, passing the trash, whatever you want to call it. We cannot keep thinking that we're creating accountability by telling a person they can't be at our institution anymore, but then helping them to get a position somewhere else, which is very common. How do you think Komarov went from University of Chicago to Harvard? It wasn't because the people at University of Chicago warned the Harvard off, right? They most likely said things like, well, you know, it just didn't work out for him here, but he's a really great guy, so you should you should consider him for this position, um, or even maybe more strongly worded than that. It's hard to know. Um, but what's really disturbing to me about this particular phenomenon, the way that um, men, and, and I should note, by the way, that women are capable of harassing people as well. And, um, and obviously there's more than just male and female genders. And actually those who are um, sexual and, and gender minorities are more likely to experience sexual harassment. Still the vast majority of cases um, that we know of anyway are, are men harassing women. But so anyway, when when organizations do eventually say, you know, this person can't be in our organization anymore, there seems to be a concerted effort to help them land on their feet. And on the other side of it, the people who they've harassed, whose careers have been damaged, they're often ousted completely from the field because they can't get letters of recommendation. They can't get support and they don't want to interact with this person ever again. So that's the other side of the coin um, that I feel like we're not talking about as much as we should be. So I wanna just briefly talk about what that experience is like for the person who's been sexually harassed. So the first thing of course is that the, the harassment happens. <clears throat> but after that, there's often confusion. Like, well, what do they really mean? There's like this um, second guessing that you do of like, 
well, maybe am I overreacting? Like this person has done X, Y, Z nice things for me. Like maybe they didn't mean it, et cetera. In that process of like not really knowing whether to believe what you personally experienced and not knowing who you can talk to about it leads to a lot of mental and emotional distress. And then there's this question of reporting, which we talked about. People have to consider that. And it's not an easy choice because if you don't report, then that behavior can continue on. But if you do report, then you risk all of the really challenging things that happen after reporting, which is this investigation that happens. Um, often, by the way, I mean, the, the reporting system is so flawed just in general uh, across our institutions. Um, so th one of the things that happens is that once people report, they really have no control over anything that happens. They have no control over who the Title IX office talks to, for example, or what they share exactly about the story or um, <clears throat> what the consequences are, if any, for the person who, who created the harm. Um, there's not really like a restorative justice model yet for this process. And so often people who report don't even know eventually what the consequences of any there were for the person who they reported. Um, so it can be a really difficult um, thing to go through. And then of course there's DARVO, deny, attack, reverse victim and offender, which is a very commonly used strategy, which by the way, Sabatini has tried to use against the, the junior faculty person who he was um, involved with saying that basically she, she's wrong. This isn't what she's saying isn't true. And she's the problem because X, Y, Z. Like this is very common that the person who has been accused of um, causing harm says, no, no, it's not me. Actually, it's the other person who's the problem. And, and this is why people talk about the need to be a perfect victim and how if the person who is reporting has any flaws whatsoever, like they drink alcohol sometimes or they were in an abusive relationship at some point in their past or whatever, that that ends up being used against them to say that they're not credible or that they deserved whatever was happening. Um, so it's it really messed up and adds obviously to the harm that these folks are experiencing. And then of course, if, they're, if they want to have any um, legal representation, if they're going to pursue any kind of suit, then there's huge amounts of legal fees that come into play. And <clears throat> many people need therapy to deal with all of the harm. And it can all lead, as I mentioned earlier, to career loss because it's very hard to move forward in any profession if the people who you've worked with, the people who've trained you will not support you. And if you have been sexually harassed by someone, if you did the brave thing and reported it, they're obviously not going to support you in your next step. And then, of course, relationship strain within all our personal relationships also happens because as we're going through something that's so difficult and stressful, it's really hard to be to show up in our best possible way as our best self for the other people in our lives. And then there's a question of whether you settle, um, which is a, a big question that we're not going to really address today, but settlements often require a non-disclosure agreement. So sometimes there can be, you know, some terms that they will agree with um, that may even include some financial compensation in exchange for not saying anything. And um, that also puts people in a really tough bind because again, they many people come forward because they don't want the harm to continue to other people. And so if there's an NDA and everything's kept under wraps, then that goal does not happen. It's not achieved. And so this is from uh, the National Academies report, again, showing all the things that we just talked about, that when people experience sexual harassment, there is decreased job satisfaction, there's organizational withdrawal. Um, people are more likely to leave the institution to leave their profession. There's harms or decreases in productivity and, 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 and worsening performance. And I would say more importantly, really significant mental and physical health outcomes for these individuals. And because of all of this, the, the uh, NASM report concluded that the cumulative effect of sexual harassment is a significant and costly loss of talent in academic science, engineering, and medicine. So you can think about all the ideas that never uh, were explored because of people who left. The, all the solutions, all the, uh, the treatments for diseases that were never discovered because the people who would have cared to work on those issues had to take a career pivot because they met a roadblock that was sexual harassment and their institution wasn't willing to handle it. So they instead pivoted another direction and we as a society lose in that circumstance. 
And I just want to add very quickly, because I know you're going to be talking about this a little bit next week as well, that sexual harassment, like this is an extension, this maternal discrimination is an extension of sexual harassment and is another barrier to women's careers in science, engineering, and medicine. And it's it's motherhood in, in particular that people have a problem with. It's not parenthood, it's motherhood. Um, and this was a study of physician mothers' experiences of workplace discrimination uh, that came out a couple of years ago, showing that um, there's several different assumptions that women who are mothers in medicine face, like these ideas that mothers cannot be successful doctors, that doctors cannot be good mothers, that women physicians should de delay childbearing, that childbearing necessarily ruins women physicians' careers. And by the way, of course, nobody thinks any of those things about men who are having children. Um, they also talked about a, a significant lack of support during pregnancy and the, and the postpartum period, including needing to forego leave, being subjected to rules and expectations that were not applied to male colleagues, and then being passed over for leadership positions in favor of people who are less qualified. So they, they found insidious, persistent, and sometimes blatant discrimination experienced by physicians based on their status as mothers. And we had a, a study that we did a, a few years back looking at specifically surgery residents and what their experience was with thinking about taking leave um, and, and building their families during their training. And what we found was that, this will not be surprising to most of you, that residents felt that a leave would put an unreasonable strain on other residents in their training program. And, um, and this was true for um, maternity um, and for paternity. So regardless of which parent was taking the leave. And when we asked them, what were the biggest obstacles for those who did take parental leave? What were the biggest obstacles that you faced in taking parental leave? Um, and then for those who hadn't taken leave, we said, what would, what would be the biggest obstacles, obstacles for you to take parental leave? And, um, for both of these groups, a perceived or actual lack of support from faculty and peers was one of the major factors. So, as women are building their careers, we're facing sexual sexual harassment and gender-based harassment in a number of different ways. And we're receiving all these messages about how we can't or shouldn't build our families during our training. And even after training, there's a lot of um, negative uh, connotations to building a family if you're a woman. But those things are not, um, it's not considered to be negative if you're a man. And actually uh, data on CVs or uh, sorry, hiring studies show that Men who are parents get a boost in how hireable they are, and women who are parents are, are thought to be less worthy candidates. So I'm going to wrap up here in just a minute so that we can um, have a little more time for, for questions. Um, but despite all of this, the sexual harassment, the maternal discri discrimination, the delaying of our childbearing, the delaying of our families, women physicians are still able to provide better care on the whole than our men physicians. And there's a number of studies that have um, been looking at this. This was um, a commentary that I wrote um, earlier this year about a study that came out in JAMA Surgery looking at surgical outcomes showing that regardless of the patient's gender, they um, had better outcomes. They were less likely to die if their surgeon was a woman rather than if the surgeon was a man. And it just makes me think like how well would our patients be doing and how well would we be doing if we didn't have to overcome all these obstacles, right? There would be an even bigger gap in our performance. And despite all that, we're still not getting paid. We're not being promoted at the same rates. We're not getting um, nominated for leadership roles and we're not getting appointed to these leadership roles at the same rate as our men. So it's pretty much completely unjust. And so I wanna take us back to 2018. So hashtag me too went viral in fall of 2017. January of um, 2018 was the Golden Globes and the rollout of Time's Up, which is a topic for another day. But many of us remember Oprah's speech, which was impassioned. And this quote has still stuck with me where she said, for too long, women have not been heard or believed if they dared to speak the truth to the power of those men. But their time is up, she said. And I, for one, was very hopeful that that statement was true. And unfortunately, I don't think it is yet, but 
hopefully we'll get there. I think that all the things that I've marked in red here are places where we can intervene to make the experience um, of what happens after the harassment better for those who are experiencing it. Uh, every single one of these things, you could probably even say the mental and emotional distress, relationship strain, but all along here are ways that we could do better. For example, institutions could cover legal fees for people who are bringing concerns. Because why? Because they're actually helping the institution. And this is actually an act of courage mm -hmm. to bring forward a concern. Um, we, we could change reporting to be a much more supportive process for those who are who are willing to take it on. Um, there's many, many things we could do there. Um, recognizing DARVA when it happens and stopping this idea uh, or interrupting this idea that people need to be the perfect victim in order to be able to bring a concern or to have their concerns listened to. So anyway, all of these points are points of potential intervention. I'm going to skip over that and then say that back to what I said earlier, that what we're trying to do is to look at the tolerance piece. Um, and how do we prevent the harassment from happening in the first place, right? Because like I said, we could intervene at all those points on that last slide, but what if we could just prevent the harassment from happening in the first place? And so um, Dr. Aurora and uh, Dr. Filin at Yale and several of our colleagues and I have um, submitted this grant, which we recently got funded from the NIH to do a five-year study looking at T32 postdoctoral training programs to implement an intervention on sexual harassment. And it's going to include civility training, microaggressions, upstanding, implicit bias, and specifically sexual harassment. So trying to address multiple different related issues that would lead to um, or allow sexual harassment to occur. And then we're gonna measure um, outcomes at the level of the, um, the mentors and the PI. So the intervention really is focused on the people who are doing the training, not the trainees in those programs, but the PIs and the mentors. Um, and so we want to look at, you know, their experience of those PIs and mentors, but also to look at the climate and culture of their training programs and see, um, you know, if we're able to impact the experience of those trainees, if there's differences in their level of productivity, and in particular, their persistence in biomedical research careers. Again, going back to that point I made earlier about how people who face uh, sexual harassment often will just leave the field or change their career path. So we're trying to, um, change that and retain folks who have already shown a commitment to biomedical research um, and try to prevent the harms that might cause them to leave. So uh, this is the last quote I have here, which is from that piece that I wrote in 2019. Vulnerable sick people deserve to be cared for by experts who can work at the top of their game, unfettered by workplace harassment and discrimination. And while that's a, what they deserve, it's not yet what we have. And you know, I think that everyone here hopefully can commit to trying to create that space and to trying to mitigate harm and trying to support the people who are having these negative experiences and valuing them when they, when they dare to speak up, when they have the courage to speak up, um, because it's a very, very hard thing to do. Uh, that, that's it for the slides. Um, you can connect with me in any number of ways. I'm probably the worst on email out of all those things. But uh, anyway, <laughs> I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Sale. So I'm just going to read um, a couple of comments from the chat that came up. And if anyone else wants to um, put another question in. So one, uh, Rachel Harriman wrote, um, what is your perspective on why institutions are so hesitant to publicly address sexual harassment and those involved? Do you feel that this is still a major cultural change that is yet to happen? Yeah, um, I think that it's complicated. Um, and that's why, so, you know, I, I don't think that institutions uh, are trying or want to do the wrong thing. Like, I don't think that people are malicious. But I think it's very challenging, the Title IX law and uh, all the details of it make it very hard for institutions to behave in a different way. And even though Title IX was initially, you know, it, it was supposed to help, right? And it does in many ways, uh, aside from this specific topic, it does help. But the things around, um, you know, basically protecting the identity of the person who's been accused and employment issues of like not being able to share consequences for people um, or because of privacy concerns um, and, and the idea of mandatory reporting, which I didn't mention earlier, but you know, at many institutions, folks like us are mandatory reporters. And that means that 
if somebody like a trainee were to come to me and tell me about an instance of sexual harassment, regardless of what that trainee wants, I have to report it, which again, takes power away from that trainee. And that was instituted, of course, to be like, we want to not have sexual harassment. So everyone who hears about it should report. But that the unintended consequence is that we're then disempowering the people who we really should be supporting the most. So I think a lot of it is, is to do with just the legalities and the way that the good intentions have been operationalized um, in, in pretty much all our institutions. So I think that's a major issue. But I also think that there is a, a re reticence to um, to have true accountability. Like, I think that people want to believe the best in other people, and in particular, people they've worked with for a long time. And so they don't want to um, believe that this person who was nice to them, right? How often do we hear, well, he's never done anything like that to me, or I've never experienced that with this person, as though the fact that you never experience it means it never happens. Right. And this is just a human thing. Like we all do this where we think that the people interacting with us interact the same way with everybody else as they do with us. And that's just not true. Right. Um, so I think it's, you know, some legal factors and it's just some natural human factors. And we need to kind of address both. Also, I'll just say it's very hard to hold people accountable for these things. So I, I'm not trying to make excuses for leaders, but I, I do understand that it's challenging because they'll have their own version of the story. And then, you know, in many of these things, there's not video, you know, like, so that's where you get into this idea that it's he, he said, she said, but I just want to state clearly that reporting is very, very hard. So to me, anyone who brings a claim and is willing to go through this process that gives them immense credibility for me because you would be really irrational to go through all that for something that didn't happen to you because the harms are just too much. Yeah, thank you for that. I've seen that too. Um, Deb Burnett had her hand up in the middle of the talk. I don't know if she still has a question, but I <laughs> gave her some space to talk if she still um, has a comment. Uh, no, I didn't have a question. I did put some stuff in the chat earlier, but I'm sorry, I didn't have a question right now. Okay, great. Thank you. And then um, Argo, I think Dr. Rora has a question, then we have another question I'll read off in the chat after that. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Salas. I um, wanted to reflect a little bit with you about where our institution is. Um, you know, I think not everyone here might know that we are um, uh, one of the founding members of the National Academies um, um, a collaborative to end sexual harassment in higher education with, along with Stanford and other institutions. And, um, and so we have a team of people working on this from the campus side, from the, you know, higher ed, especially from the college. Um, and certainly, you know, it's something that we need to think about in healthcare as well. Um, so we have a, um, a requirement now in the state of Illinois for one hour of sexual harassment training for all licensed providers, um, you know, that, that we routinely meet through this campus education, um, you know, that, that we are doing, I just got my email for doing next year's. And so I know that, you know, you're thinking about this as an expert with the stop grant, et cetera, but, you know, as, a, as an, you know, the question for educators is, does this work? Like, does a one hour training work? Do we need to do more? You know, what is it that we can do as a campus and as a community to be confident that we can actually, you know, improve our, our culture and um, tackle the iceberg, if you will? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And I actually was talking about um, our grant and a little bit about sexual harassment to a non-medical audience last week. And one of the people said, well, how did you decide that you wanted to target preventing harassment because culture change is really hard. Like, why did you decide to try to do that? And I said, true, um, but really, um, I think I think it's worth, as, as I think you do too, worth trying because if, if we can prevent the harm in the first place, we don't have all that spin out of all the, the things that come after. But um, does a one hour training work? I mean, the data that um, I'm aware of anyway suggests that no, a one hour training is ineffective. Um, there is a lot more data on so-called diversity trainings than there is on, specifically on sexual harassment trainings, at least that I'm aware of. And those data suggest that we need at least four hours of um, training to 
have an impact. Um, but in general, I think the idea is to have more distributed learning. So not a one to, once a year, one hour thing that you maybe even just turn on and walk away and then come back later um, or just click through and then answer the questions where like clearly we all know that we're not getting anything out of that process. Um, so distributed learning um, that is more than an hour a week. Certainly that seems to be necessary for something to be effective. But I think uh, as we've talked about before, like it's not clear what's going to be effective. Like we're going to try civility training, upstanding, et cetera, because these are things that make sense to try, but that doesn't mean they're going to be effective. No, thank you. And certainly an area that we look forward to hearing more about. So. Right. So I'll just summarize. Robert gave three comments, which are interesting when you're referring to the Mayo physician who's moved from Mayo to, to the mayor, Arizona, he was just commenting. It's like moving a priest from church to church. <laughs> You know, that scandal and then also just supported your stop the you know prevention that your the grant that you got with Dr. Aurora um, and then I'll just read out the next question um, um, in the JAMA article about female surgeons having less deaths than male surgeons was that broken down by surgical specialties so they actually have um, 25 different cases that they looked at across different specialties so I do know that they um they included uh, procedures from many different surgical subspecialties. Um, I don't recall if they were able to look within each specialty because the data becomes fragmented. Um, either, I would have to go back and look at it, so I don't know exactly the right answer, but either there was no difference or they weren't able to look at it. Yeah. That's as much as I remember of that one, sorry. All right, another one from Elizabeth Foster. You mentioned earlier how a lot of women experiencing sexual harassment in the workplace can compartmentalize those experiences and consider themselves in the twilight zone, where somehow obviously wrong actions are acceptable. I think that this can make it more difficult in the future to move forward with reporting when you believe that you were actively accepting that behavior at the time. Any thoughts how people can reframe their experiences with this in mind? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that we should judge ourselves for our past um, choices because we're constantly learning and evolving. And so how we look at a situation today should be different from how we looked at it a year ago or five years ago. If not, we're not growing as people. So I think that's just normal to, especially when you're um, like relatively junior or early on in your career and you're not sure what is supposed to be happening around you. Um, certainly the most conservative safest thing for you to do to protect your career is, is to say nothing right so th there are reasons that we behave in the ways that we do like i think there's a lot of pathologizing that occurs especially related to women's behaviors and then people want to like fix us but there's a reason that we behave the ways that we do for example people say like oh you shouldn't apologize in your emails um or you shouldn't use exclamation marks uh or exclamation points because like you don't need to do that that's just over whatever emoting but the thing is the reason people especially women do those things is that if we don't over apologize and if we don't have those exclamation marks people just think that we're being harsh so it's very easy to say oh like you shouldn't have done that or you shouldn't do that but at the same time that's ignoring the very reasons for which we do those things so i guess what i'm saying is give yourself some grace that whatever you accept it. and I'm not I don't actually agree that you accept it but whatever you chose not to report at the time doesn't it's not a moral failing to not have reported it it's part of your own growth to understand what is acceptable what is not acceptable and and to know where you want to take a stand which there is no right answer we all have to make those decisions for ourselves so I I just don't think there's I don't think it's that helpful to you know go oh i wish i had done xyz yeah like there's many things that many of us wish we had done differently but we can't go back in time so the question is how does that inform the choices you make moving forward uh great thank you for that um i think that Bita has is Bita is in a room of ethics fellows here in the ethics library and um one of the ethics fellows had a question Bita, i don't know if you want to do it say it verbally or you just want me to read it out yeah i can read it out for you so it is in the chat um, Carly asked, do we have data on the effects to the careers of the reporters? Um, like MERS, I don't know that I have I'm thinking about that for a second. I don't 
think that I've seen numbers on that. I think what we know is, you know, from the experiences of folks who've shared. So, for example, the students in that lawsuit against Komarov, they talk about how, you know, they left anthropology completely um, in order to avoid this person. Or I forget exactly what his like subspecialized area in anthropology was, but if they didn't leave anthropology, they definitely stopped studying that specific thing um, in order to avoid him. So we know that that it happens, um, and I. I think it probably happens to every single person who reports to some degree. Um, but I don't, I'm not aware of any specific data on that. I can add that we will have um, a, an expert in um, sort of the discussions around what the network of silence um, and why people are silenced coming. So Dr. Lilia Cortina is coming from Michigan. And, um, and so that would be a great question to carry over as well. Um, because I do think there's a lot of debate as as um, um, Argavan mentioned about mandatory reporting and so it's put into place as a good thing but I, I know the Department of Education was taking a lot of comments about whether or not this this stifles reporting and so so I think these are good questions for for the policies good. So there's a couple questions I can answer easily. One is, is the recording available? And yes, the recordings are always available on the McLean YouTube channel, um, which you can go to by just typing in McLean YouTube. Um, and then um, there is um, CME. If we put the CME in the chat, you can get CME. Um, and I'll just say one more thing is that Dr. Uh, Lila Cortina is coming in person. Um, so she'll be here the week after Thanksgiving and will be in P117 live and also on Zoom for those who wanna join that way. Um, so I will, I'm just gonna you know, continue to read these questions to you, Dr. Sales. So um, the notion, but the notion of believing the best in people doesn't apply to everyone equally. I feel like more grace is afforded, afforded to white men. Yep, accurate. Yeah, <laughs> okay. And then um, are there any papers on which medical specialties are the most male dominated? Oh yeah, you can look. AAMC has um, data that they publish every year on the breakdown by gender and at even different ranks and gender and race uh, for all the different specialties. Yeah, exactly. And then maybe we, I can send that link because I think I have that data um, to the AAMC. And then um, a substantial, meaningful training with sponsored by um, with or sponsored by the local leaders, which could be the department head, the division head is more useful than a brief online requirement sent from a kind of anonymous office. This approach, approach was chosen recently in one of our units and is um, being as being a more promising approach for meaningful change. I think that like live or discussion as opposed to watch this, you know, kind of online module that's required for you, I think is the point. I don't know if you well, it's that, but it's also that we value our leaders. And so if the leader is showing up and saying, this is something that matters, um, this is something that's really important, then that impacts how everyone else takes in that information. So I do agree, like in general, live things are are more engaging, right, for all of us. But, um, but it's also the, the impact of the leader endorsing this as being an important thing and, and taking a stand that that enables other people to also view it the same way and also makes people feel like, oh, well, if this person cares, then if I do bring up a concern, right, that it may be handled more appropriately than I would otherwise have assumed. Yeah, I have a question myself and that is, I've heard this argument um, a lot is that the culture has changed. So what was acceptable previously is now not acceptable and and that is a little bit of an excuse, you know. So that I didn't, I didn't see, I didn't understand that the culture was changing. So I've been doing this for a long time, and now it's unacceptable. And how am I to know that? Do you know what I mean? So do you have any discussion around that? Yeah, I mean, I, I I know that people do say things like that, or they'll say like, oh, well, he's older, he didn't mean anything by patting you on the head or whatever. Um, but uh, I I. I mean, I yes, we have to like have some grace for the people around us if if and, and intention does matter to some degree, I think, even though some people think intention doesn't matter at all. I do think it matters some, but impact matters more than intention. And um, it really kind of doesn't matter what your intention was if the person who you're interacting with felt harmed. 
And that's the part that we need to focus on and figure out how to stop that harm. And again, it doesn't matter. Like maybe you didn't mean anything by it, but in reality, it doesn't matter what you meant. What matters is how it was received. And I know that that's a hard concept for a lot of people because they feel like, well, if I didn't mean it, I shouldn't be held accountable or something like that. But, but that's just not how the world works. Like what we say and do impacts the people around us. That's just reality. And we may not always be able to predict what those impacts are. Um, and I think that that's okay. But when people tell us what the impact is, then we have to believe them. And it, it has to be from a place of, um, oh, rather than be defensive. And I think if we have organizations and institutions and departments where everyone is doing that and, you know, giving each other feedback um, frequently and in low stakes manner, then we can start to change the culture. Thank you for that. Yeah. So Dr. Heckman Pana had a question. I don't know if Dr. Heckman Pana, you want to type it in or if you want me to promote you. So if you just message us, I'll figure out how to do what you would like. And then I'll just read Pringle Miller had a um, a comment, the Physician Just Equity nonprofit organization has found that of the peers they've supported, 22% have changed specialties due to discrimination. Um, Dr. Pringle, Dr. Pringle Miller is going to be another speaker, I think, later down the road. I don't have the exact date on there, but it's um, somewhere in the winter or spring. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with her work, but I think she was just commenting and giving some feedback on um, what you what you talked about. No, it's great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Humphrey is also speaking later. So a lot of our future speakers coming to hear you, <laughs> which is wonderful. Um, Dr. Heckman, I can allow you to talk. How about if I um, let you do that and you can see if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? By the way, Dr. Humphrey was just here last week. Uh -huh. oh, at, Stanford. Yeah. at Stanford for a talk. That's great. Well, we're also um, so the the it should doesn't escape me that the Association of American Medical Colleges is meeting in Nashville this week um, weekend for the first time in person, and um, a lot of the talks focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, as well as learning environment. So certainly, this is top of mind for quite a number of our medical schools and academic medical centers. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I may. Um... I wanted to say I enjoyed very much your talk, and particularly, <clears throat> I was impressed that uh, you connected it with power. And, uh, and I just wonder, in part, if this is not evolutionary issue, that not only in relation to the sexual issue is related to the power as a whole in a society the, in which we haven't learned to uh, respect individual rights. Um, if you look at the animals, uh, you could see as soon as another male and female come, the male jumps on the female without any permission. Or if it comes to the areas of the thing, they, uh, they try to hit that animal and get it out of there. And a part of the becoming human is that we put a break on our desires in order to be civilized. And a part of it is to learn individual human rights, that we would learn it at a school, not only in relation to the sexual, but even in relation to what you were talking in relation to the medicine. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Heckman. Pada. We'll give her an opportunity just to respond to your reflection. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I think I follow what you're saying, and I think that um, the issue of power, for me, also, where one part of the issue about power is that often people do not recognize their own power. So, you know, a faculty member at a school of medicine might be interacting with a, a resident, and that faculty member may not really see him or herself as different. From the resident um because maybe they're very humble that way and um and they think that they're just showing up in that space just like everyone else um but there is inherent power right in their role and so when that person speaks to residents or medical students um there's not really a 
free exchange of ideas because they're in a, a position right where they're supervising, where they're evaluating and so on. And if, and I think part of where people get in trouble is not recognizing the power that they have, because sometimes there are things that if you said to a, a true peer, like they may not be offended or take harm or, or think that it was a microaggression or whatever. But when you're a, someone in a position of power saying that to someone who you're supervising or, or mentoring or evaluating, then it can be very different. The impact can be very different. And so we have to be aware when we show up in spaces of how much power we have or don't have and what's the status associated with different aspects of our identity that we don't control. For example, this is getting to the comment earlier about how yeah, white men have higher status in our society. So yes, they're given more grace, they're given more opportunities, their words uh, are carry more weight, et cetera. And so they need to be aware of that too when they show up in spaces. So there's power in our, um, you know, whether we have an accent or don't have an accent, the color of our skin, how light or dark, regardless of what our race or ethnicity is, um, and what our formal power comes from our different titles and positions that we may hold, but also informal power from our, our gender, our sexual orientation, and so on. So anyway, there's all of that is, it kind of goes together, like you can't really disentangle. Um, but I think that one of the biggest challenges is people who don't recognize where they're coming in, like in terms of that power and status and acting like, or thinking that they, they don't we're not understanding how much extra weight their words have because of that power and status. Right, yeah, one of the anonymous attendees said to that point, men have been socialized to think that this behavior is okay, um, maybe necessary, uh, make me necessary to move up, like having that power is necessary. So, so yeah, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. I think we'll end the recording there. And then um, Dr. Sales does have 10 to 15 minutes. If Ethics Fellows wanna raise their hand, we can promote you to a panelist. You can 